All right, so uh, hopefully you guys have had a chance. The, the, the videos from last week's lectures are on YouTube. Uh, hopefully you got a chance to look at them. If you did, it's okay. Uh, you just have to catch up a little bit. Um, so last time, uh, remind me, Michael, what were you doing? We were, we were, oh, we solved the Dirac equation, right? We had to, uh, work through the solution of the Dirac equation. Uh, we talked about positive and negative frequency. Yeah, so we did, yeah. Uh, was the last we did some normalization. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we had started with the Dirac equation. We were looking for solutions. And we showed that uh, the, the, spin, the Dirac spinner also obeys the Klein Horton equation, right? So, so we know that it is, at least has a plane wave piece, right? And then we were solving for the, the other piece and found that, that we had four independent solutions. Um, so what I want to do today is finally uh, start to talk about um, the quantization of the Dirac field. <laughs> it seems like it's taking us forever to get there, um, but we're we're finally here. Okay. And zoom out. All right. And so today I want to work through the quantization. And actually, we're going to work through, uh, well, I'll get there. Okay. So let's start. Um, the first thing we have to do is construct. I want to try to. Uh, Quantize the theory, like you know, we're going to try to follow uh, what we did for the Klein-Gordon case. Okay, and on the Klein-Gordon case, we started with the Hamiltonian, and we had some uh, commutation relations for the uh, field and its conjugate momenta, and then we said, well, let's try to model this after the some harmonic oscillator or second quantization, and we went from there, right? So the first thing we need to do for the for the Dirac theory is construct the Hamiltonian. Okay, but so far all we've really talked about uh, was the Lagrangian, which we wrote last time as psi r uh, i gamma mu del mu minus m psi. Remember, psi r is the psi dagger times gamma zero. Okay. <clears throat> All right, so uh, in order to construct the Hamiltonian, uh, which let me remind you is a spatial integral of what? Uh, the time derivative of our field times the conjugate momenta, and then we subtract off the Lagrangian density. Okay? So this is what we want to construct uh, from this guy. Okay, so the first thing I have to do is. Uh, Find the conjugate momentum. So the conjugate momentum. All right, and the way I want to do that is by taking the uh, derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to the time derivative of our field, our Dirac field. Okay, and uh, so let me do that. So when I do that on this Lagrangian. What it's going to do is it's going to pick out the mu equals zero piece, right? Mu equals zero piece is going to be the time derivative piece. So all this stuff is acting to the right here, right? So it's acting on that field there. And so if I take the uh, time derivative of this thing, of this Lagrangian, I'm going to end up with a term that goes like uh, psi bar and then i gamma zero, right? Because the, it's taking the derivative with respect to the time derivative of the field. Okay? And so there's several ways I can write this. I can write it like this, or I can uh, expand out what this thing is. So this is psi dagger gamma zero times i gamma right? And we know that gamma zero times gamma zero is, is just the identity operator. Right? So I can write i psi dagger. Okay? All right, so we have the conjugate momentum. And now we just need to plug it in 
uh, to our Hamiltonian expression. And if I do that, I have a, a spatial integral here. And then uh, pi, uh, so pi is, I'm going to plug in for, I'm going to plug in uh, I psi dagger. And then I have the time derivative of psi. It is, I'm rewriting this psi dot is just del dot psi. Let's see why in a second. Uh, minus the Lagrangian, which is psi bar. And I gamma mu del mu maximum psi del. Okay? And now uh, I want to use a trick uh, where I can insert one, but I'm going to insert one in the form of gamma zero squared. So what I have is uh, d three x pi psi bar or psi dagger, sorry, uh, gamma zero squared. So gamma zero times gamma zero, del zero psi, and mm -hmm. this stuff remains the same. You guys, let me know if I ever if I run off the page, okay? Or run off the screen. <clears throat> okay, so now what I see is that this thing is going to give me psi bar, and this thing is going to cancel off the time. So when I expand this out, there's going to be a uh, gamma zero del zero minus what I would call a gamma vector dotted into uh, a del vector, I guess. Right? Or really, what we, how we wrote this, not what, right? And so what's going to happen is this piece is going to get canceled off by this piece. And I end up with uh, okay. Okay. So I end up with uh, a little bit lower. lower. Yes. Like that. Uh -huh. Thank okay. you. And so I end up with a Hamiltonian that looks like uh, D3x. I've got my um, psi bar uh, minus a uh, gamma vector as an novella plus n psi. Okay. All right, so we have our Hamiltonian, and this is the thing that we want to try to um, try to quantize. Right? But before I do that, I just want to show you a cute little thing. Um, so if you remember back from you know when, when you study relativistic quantum mechanics, uh, and whatnot, you make a relate you, we you make a relationship between, or maybe we did it in this class. I can't remember. Uh, you make a relationship between uh, the alpha, the alpha matrices and the beta matrix uh, mm -hmm. from Dirac's formulation with our gamma matrices, right? And so alpha is defined as uh, gamma zero, gamma vector, and beta is just gamma zero. And so if I take the stuff inside the square brackets here, well, along with, well, let's say the integrand of this Hamiltonian, and let me write it, rewrite it here. So psi bar, minus psi bar, psi bar, psi bar. And now let me uh, rewrite psi bar, psi dagger, gamma zero, uh, minus i. Okay. And now let me take this gamma zero inside and then use these definitions that, that we have here. Right? And so if I do that, I have psi, dag psi dagger. And gamma zero gamma vector is minus uh, alpha vector dotted into del, uh, and then plus beta m and beta is to, or plus gamma zero m and gamma zero is just beta times m psi. And this operator, which is what this thing is, should look familiar, right? Because it's what we call the Dirac operator, right? It's the Hamiltonian piece on the right-hand side of the Dirac equation. Remember? Mm -hmm. Everybody remember? Okay. I had, I had blank look, so I wanted to make sure. Okay, so this thing we call, uh, it's typically called little h 
And then sub D just to remind you that it's the Dirac operator. Okay. But what we're looking at, so um, we're, so our Hamiltonian that we want to solve this thing, <coughs> bless you, uh, is uh, so this is what we're looking for are basically eigenfunctions uh, that satisfy the Dirac equation. Okay, so we're we're looking for solutions. Uh, just keep that in mind that when we write out, when we expand this field out, we're looking for uh, the guys that are uh, eigenfunctions of the Dirac Hamilton. Does it look like uh, you're in synergy? You said the Hamilton units are in synergy. Um, it is Lorentz invariant, but it's not. Um, it's not explicitly. Yeah, that's why we like to work with the Lagrange typically in particle physics, right? But we haven't done anything, you know, to mess up the uh, uh, the Lorentz invariance, right? Um, I don't know how you would show that, honestly, but but yeah, it's still Lorentz invariant, uh, but typically, you know, once we get past quantization, we work with the Lagrange. And it's just because of that fact, yeah. Okay, but we know the direct equation is Lorentz invariant, right? So you start out with it starts out Lorentz invariant. We don't do anything to screw yeah, it up. We use this pi psi dot minus l, which was in the class. It's a classic formula. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah that, that psi dot. The time derivative, yeah, the time derivative, it makes it look, yeah, it makes it look like it might be, uh, you know, that it might violate Lorentz invariance. But the fact that we get out uh, Dirac's, you know, Dirac's operator uh, is telling me that, it, I'm telling you, I'm telling all of us that this thing is Lorentz invariant. Yeah. That's why I'm saying, I don't know, <clears throat> I don't know how to show it, because like, yeah, like you're saying, from here it looks like uh, the Hamiltonian is not Lorentz invariant, but we know that. Okay, good question. All right. Okay, so we have we've got our Hamiltonian, and we want to try to um, want to try to uh, quantize this thing. And what we want to do, what we're going to do is we're going to follow uh, the Klein-Gordon analogy, meaning we've already you know we've already quantized one theory. Right? We've already seen how, how, how to do it, right? And so we're going to try to apply this, uh, this analogy, right? And I'm going to subtitle this thing, how not to quantize the Dirac field. Okay, so we're going to make some assumptions along the way, and we're going to see that those assumptions uh, Screw up the quantization of the Dirac field, but it'll lead us to the true, you know, the, 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 the real way of doing it. Okay. So if we're going to follow the Klein-Gordon analogy, uh, the first thing we want to do is impose some commutation relations on our fields, right? So in fact, uh, when we were doing the Klein-Gordon, we had commutation relations that looked like this: x and y. And we had some direct delta function to the next one. So this was the Klein Gordon way. Right? So if we're going to follow that analogy, we might say, okay, well, let's write down a commutation relation uh, for our Dirac field, again with a, a new you know, conjugate momentum. And in this case, we have spinner indices. So we have to keep track of the spinner indices. Okay, so we're going to um, Postulate that maybe this is the commutation relation for uh, our spinner field. Okay, so we have an extra uh, uh, prime or delta function for the spinner indices. <coughs> in fact, if I do that and I use our, our prior calculation that says that our momentum i psi dagger, that leads me to a commutation relation that says a, psi a of x. I get a factor of i, which is going to cancel this factor of i, psi dagger, b, y. 
is equal to delta 3 times minus y. So this is my uh, canonical uh, commutation relation between the fields. Okay, so I've um, started with by writing it in terms of a field and its conjugate momenta, but I can reduce that to a, a commutation relation between the field and its uh, dagger. Okay, and the first thing you notice, if you're paying attention, is there, Looks like there's a contradiction. And I say question mark. Because over here, uh, this thing is symmetric. So this thing is symmetric. Symmetric under the interchange of x and y. Right? Whereas this thing over here is anti symmetric. Right? So why is it anti symmetric? Uh, it's just been anti symmetric. Because if I exchange x and y here, right, it's a commutator, so it will pick up a minus sign. Okay. Um, but let's just trudge on, okay? So, so that's a possible contradiction. Uh, it might be hinting at some, some problem, okay? but. Let's just keep going and see uh, see where, how far we get. Thank you. Thank you. you. Um, back in the commutation relations. Mm -hmm. um, how did it go from pi of y to? So I'm using this. this I'm using pi is equal to i. So oh, okay. okay. Yeah. All right. Because we want to. We don't want to work with pi. We want to work with our size. And 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 psi goes to uh, psi. Well, we're just using the analogy, okay? So here, um, here we worked with, remember, the, the, the pi, uh, the phi field and the pi field, right? right? And here we're working with, uh, oh, so, so we're just doing, this it's is just the a general graph. field and then it's conjugate. Right, so the Klein Gordon case, this is for the scalar field, okay. right? And now we're talking about spinner fields, but we're using, we're going to try to just uh, quantize this thing using the you know the way that we quantize the Klein board. Okay. And the way we started there was we had the Hamiltonian, right, and we we imposed some canonical commutation relation on the field and its conjugate momentum, right? Just like you would in, in regular quantum mechanics, you know, you, you impose a commutation relation between x and p, right? Right. Okay. Right. Alright. Okay, so we have so we've got the Hamiltonian, we've got the commutation relation, right? And the next thing we want to do is try to find uh, a representation of those commutation relations in terms of annihilation and creation operators. Okay, so we're gonna again try to uh, construct you know um, these fields in terms of annihilation and creation operators. And we're talking about continuous space, right? We're talking about a field, so we're going to have to define, you know, Fourier modes at, at each point in space time or each point in momentum space. Okay? But we want to, the idea is again, it goes back to the simple harmonic oscillator. We want to try to find A's and A daggers that diagonalize the Hamiltonian, right? In other words, uh, uh, they give us the eigenvalues, right? Or the eigenfunctions, right? <coughs> And we've already pointed out that the Hamiltonian, right? Uh, where am I? The Hamiltonian, right? If we make, if we take a step back, we already know that the Hamiltonian is basically constructed out of the Dirac operator, right? And we know what the, the, the eigenfunctions of the Dirac operator are because we spent all last week solving the Dirac equation. Right? So in other words, we can just go straight to um, uh, what we found last time, which was that I gamma mu, gamma mu, if I start with the Dirac equation, right, and we found that uh, a psi, a, a field of the form, uh, this column vector right, times the plane wave piece solves the Dirac equation. Right? And you can show that this thing is in fact an eigenfunction, eigenfunction, of what I call HD, 
right, the Dirac operator. Right, it's an eigenfunction and it has eigenvalue equal to plus the energy. And then towards the end, of, I think last time, right, uh, we talked about the negative frequency solutions, which are also present. Right? And those we denote by a V, and with, again, with uh, this time we're going to do I plus I PX, zero. So this, is, again, is an eigenfunction, but the eigenvalue in this case is minus EP. So these are the negative energy solutions. Okay. Um, so if you remember last time, we you can, you can do this one, you can interpret these one of two ways, right? You can... Uh, Use a minus sign here, which means that you'll get a positive energy solution. Or you can choose the, the plus sign, which is normally what you would do, right? And that implies that these things have negative energy. Okay? All right. So, so we've got solutions, right? And we've got, so what's the dimensionality of, what's the dimensionality of these matrices? A, the alphas, and the betas. They're four by four. Right? That means we'll have four eigenfunctions, right? And if you count them up, we actually have two uh, US's and we have two VS's. Right? And if I add those up, I get four. <laughs> okay? <clears throat> so I got, I've got four eigenfunctions that satisfy uh, the direct equation. Right? And so those are going to be the guys that I'm going to expand uh, my wave function, or my, not my wave function. Um, it's a bad idea to teach quantum mechanics and QFT on the same day. Uh, <clears throat> that is, I'm going to expand my field. Okay? So if I use uh, just our analogy, you know, going back to uh, when we wrote down... Is it four? Yeah, four. Four. So four eigenfunction. I'm not being. I'm not. It's just schematic. I'm not yeah, being. It's it, not. It looks like a linear equation. <laughs> yeah. No. 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 It's, I'm just being. I'm just saying that we need four eigenfunctions because the, the gamma matrices are four. You know, four, four by four. Right. And we actually have two of these guys and two of these guys. Right. And they uh, obey the, the the direct equation, and so those are the four eigenfunctions that we're going to expand in. Right. Okay, so let me just write down uh, the solution, and you'll see what I'm talking about. Okay, so the, the field itself uh, is going to look similar to the klein gordon case. Okay, I have this one factor of 1 over 2 EP, okay, and then I have my exponential e to the i p dot x. But now I've got my spinner pieces, so I have to sum over the spinner pieces at, with SPN 1 and 2, so spin up, spin down. Right? And for each of those I have uh, an annihilation operator, or just some, at this point they're just coefficients, okay? So I might as well try to watch what I said. Uh, plus BS, and then here I've already done the trick where I've set P to minus P, right? This is the, this is the negative frequency solution. Uh, squeeze it in there. Okay. So you can see that it kind of looks like the Klein Gordon equation or the Klein Gordon solution, right? The big difference is that, you know, the, the direct spinner is a four, you know, it's a column vector, right? And so we have to have those uh, U's and V's in it. And by summing over S with one and two, you can convince yourself that we're using all four of the eigenfunctions, right? We're spanning. That, that span our space that we're trying to uh, work in. Okay? <laughs> All right. Oh, and another thing that we'll need will be uh, side dagger or side bar. Right? So let me take the dagger of this. So side dagger. Again, it's going to be D3P cubed over 2P root. This will be D to the minus IP of X. And I still have my sum 1, 2, 3, 
two. And now I have what, I have a dagger. S. U dagger. S. It's B dagger. S. Minus B. B dagger. Minus B. Okay. And but you note that if I hit this from the right with a gamma zero, it's going to change this into a bar, right? So it'll change this into a bar, and then it'll change the U and the B into U bar and B bar. Okay? So this is something uh, to keep in mind. All right, so we've got the solution, and the next thing we need to do is uh, impose commutation relations on uh, these annihilation and creation operators. Okay, so the, A's, the A, the B, the A daggers, and the B daggers. Okay. And so what we're going to do is follow what we did in the Klein Gordon case and postulate that we have commutation. These things obey certain commutation relations. Okay. And in particular, I've got commutation relation between A with a spinner index R and momentum P. A with a spinner index S and a dagger with momentum Q. All right, so these guys, so this guy, we're going to postulate annihilates a particle with a spinner index R and momentum P. And this guy creates a particle with spinner index S and uh, momentum Q. And likewise, we can have uh, commutation relation between the Bs. And both both of those, if you follow the Klein Gordon uh, analogy, are going to be two pi cubed delta function in the p in the q. But in this case, we also have spinner indices, so we have to put in a, a Kronecker delta t function. To the right a little bit, thank you. Kronecker delta function uh, for the spinner indices. Okay. And all others, I'm not going to write it, but all other commutators are zero. Okay. So this is the only non-zero commutator. All right. So this is shaken up uh, to be just like the Klein-Gordon case. Right. And so what we want to do are basically the homework problems. Okay. That you guys did. I actually have that created somewhere. I'll hand it back in the class, but. Um, so what we want to do is take our field expressions, so this guy, this thing, and we're going to use these guys. We're going to use these to uh, uh, shoot the Hamiltonian. Okay. And let's see what I'm at. Okay. But first we want to actually verify that uh, our commutation relations mesh with each other. In other words, if I compute, uh, so if I compute psi of x, psi of dagger of y, in terms of you know our field expressions, so I have I'm going to use two different momenta. It'll be two pi six. I got a factor of two e p. To e q, one, okay. and I've got an exponential, uh, let's see, e to the i p dot x minus, say, q dot y. Okay, and then down here I've got this mass. Okay, so this is all being multiplied. R, so I've got my sum. I'm using two different spinner indices, so let me put them here, r and s. And inside, I've got a commutator between, so, that, so I'm dropping all the terms that are non-zero. Actually, I'm just copying this straight out of uh, Eskin. <laughs> he, said, he says uh, all of these calculations are easy. Um, they just work for it. He's a copy. And they live out through. Yeah. Um, so I'm taking this is that here. Oh, okay. So this is this is U bar, okay. 
So I've got u bar, u bar s q, uh, and then I've got the commutator between d minus p r dagger. D, this is not dagger. Uh, b minus q s dagger times these guys. V r minus p, and then v bar minus q. And you might ask yourself, you know, and going from here, plugging these fields in, and to here when I'm computing this computation relation, how did I get uh, a v dagger? I mean, how did I go from daggers to bars? And the answer is that I multiplied by one over here. So I had this gamma zero left over. Okay, so I multiplied by gamma zero squared, and then I brought that gamma zero in to hit those daggers because I want to work with the, the u and v bars. All right. So obviously these these uh, these guys right are going to give us delta functions because we've postulated that they had this form right the commutators right so those will allow us to do one of the one of the integrals right the delta function uh, the Kronecker delta function in the spin will collapse the spin I mean the uh, the summation right to just one one variable and so what it boils down to is we got we need to figure out what these things are. U times U bar and V times V bar, right? Being, and when we sum over uh, one of the indices, right? So one, so only one of these indices is going to survive. Okay, so in other words, so in order to in order to you know compute this thing, we need to first consider what these things are. And these things are important. Okay, so uh, we're going to run into them a lot, right? and they're called spin sums. Because you're summing over the spin, and these things are spin okay. And so what we're looking at is this thing. We want to do. We're computing, say, for example, u, u bar, the sum, where this guy has uh, s and has an argument p. Let me see, right. So I'm doing uh, u s p, u bar s. Okay, and I'm summing over s equals one and two. Okay, so this is what we want to compute. That's what's that's what's buried in this expression for the commutator. And so if I write this thing out using the expressions that we had last time, um, this is going to be like an outer product, right? Because this is this thing is a column vector and this thing's a row vector. Okay. And so let me use the notation that I had last time, which was P dot sigma times uh, C, and I have the spin over S, and then I have P dot C bar, C S. Right? Remember, these are S, like S equals 1 would be spin up, S equals 2 would be spin down. Right? And then I've got my uh, U bar, which is uh, C S dagger, and it's P dot sigma bar. P S dagger times P dot sigma. Okay? And so remember, um, we when we multiply this out, we're building an outer product. Okay? <coughs> and I can separate the outer product between the spinners and whatever these other things are. Right? And actually, if I uh, take the outer product of these spinners, CS and CS dagger, all I get, I get something that looks like this. So I get 1, 0, 1, 0, plus the spin down. Right? And if you multiply those out, you get nothing but the identity matrix. Okay? So all we have to worry about are these square root of p dot sigma things. So if I take the outer product of that, so let me throw this arrow over here. And I compute it. I have a two by two matrix, which is p dot sigma, and then there's p dot sigma, and then p dot sigma times p dot sigma bar, 
And then the same thing up here. Right. And I have P, sorry, I get P dot sigma times P dot sigma bar. These guys are both P dot sigmas. These guys are both bars. And then here I get P dot sigma bar and then P dot sigma. Okay. <coughs> All right. So these things, uh, if you remember, we had that identity that said that uh, P dot sigma times P dot sigma bar uh, was P squared. Right. And P squared is nothing but M squared. Okay. So that means that these diagonal components are just M. Right. They give me an m squared, but I still have the square root, so it gives me an m. Okay, and these other guys give me p dot sigma here, p dot sigma bar. Okay. And you can convince yourself, right? So I've got m uh, times. Uh, basically the identity matrix, right? plus uh, P being dotted into the, the gamma matrices, right? Because the gamma matrices, these sigma, remember these sigmas are like, uh, how, do, how do they relate? Uh, the gammas, we write the gammas in terms of the sigmas, so I don't have an expression in front of me. But anyway, so we can actually write this matrix in a shorthand notation. So I have um, I'm computing sum over S of U S P e bar S P, and I get this matrix. Okay, but this matrix I can write overhand notation in terms of gamma matrices. So this is like gamma dotted into P. So this is like a, a four vector dot product plus M. Right, where M, there's a kind of a you know an identity matrix inside of here. Okay, right, and anytime we dot gamma into a four vector, we can use this the slash notation. So I can write the, write this as P slash plus M. Okay, so this spin sum for the U spinner just reduces to P slash plus plus M. Okay, that's the, and that's the piece, one of the pieces that we need um, in our commutation relation. And I'll leave it to you guys to work out, but you can also work out the spin sum of the V's. Right, that's the other piece that we need. Right, in this case, uh, you get gamma dot P and you get a minus M, which is just P slash minus M. Okay, so these are really, uh, like I said, these are very important uh, identities when it comes to uh, dealing with fermions. Okay, they're going to come into play when we compute, uh, well, we'll come back to them when we compute uh, matrix element squares. Okay, so when we start to compute cross sections and things like that, uh, these things are going to come in very handy. Okay, all right, but for the time being, we need them inside of our uh, commutation relation. And we've already established that these guys are <laughs> delta functions, right? Now we know what these things are. Okay, so let me uh, write out. Let me put back the M. So I have a uh, commutator of psi of x, psi dagger of y. Okay, so I have this integral, d3 to d pi cubed, 1 over. 2EP because now I've used the delta function and I clash into those two square roots. Then I've got e to the i p dot x minus y. Okay, this is the normal stuff. And then who do I have? I've got um, I think this is supposed to be further space. Um, so I've got one term, so this, I've got the, the first term, let's see. So this, uh, 
this guy, and this, uh, this guy, the top guy, is going to give me the p slash plus sign. Right? But let me expand out what p slash is. So it's gamma, it would be gamma zero times p zero, right? but p zero is just ep. Okay? And then I would have minus gamma dot p. And the first term gives me a plus sign. Right, so it's coming from this piece here. And then I have another term that um, would be the p slash minus m. Okay. And so then they expand that out. So I had gamma 0 ep. And in this case, um, it's, no. Ah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. So I have a minus p, that's what that's what it's doing now. So this gives me a plus gamma dot p. And then I have the minus m for the uh, v spin sum. Okay. And so what I see is that these pieces cancel, right? And then these pieces cancel, and all I'm left with is this uh, gamma zero. Uh, oh, I had another gamma zero that was over here, all right? So that gamma zero is going to come in and hit these and give me one. Right, and then I'll sum these guys, I get two, and so I get two EP out of that stuff in the, in the curly braces, and I would cancel two EP here, and so I end up with a D3P over two pi cubed, e to the IP dot x minus y. Right, and if you don't know, by now you should probably just get out of, get out of this class. <laughs> this thing is the uh, graph of the function. Right? And there's actually, just to remind you, there's an identity matrix, a 4 by 4 identity matrix there, okay? So it looks like, and somewhere I lost the, oh, I used this the spinner uh, delta function, but there's a, there would also be a, a spinner delta function, so it would be a delta function, maybe, something like that. Okay, so now we've, we've, got, we've, we've written out our Hamiltonian, we know how to expand our fields, right? And we know how they we, we impose uh, commutation relations uh, between the fields. We, we impose commutation relations between uh, the annihilation and creation operators. And we just checked that when we use our expression for the field and use those expressions for the commutation relations, we get what we wanted, which was uh, the fact that these guys have an anti-commutation relation that gives you a delta. Okay? Uh, commutation relation. Did I say anti? Uh, commutation relation. Okay? Alright, so now we're in the position that would be homework problem, I don't know, the one where you have to do the Hamiltonian, number three. So here we, would, we want to do the Hamiltonian, right? And if you plug in, so what we want to do is take our Hamiltonian, which I'll probably never be able to find here okay so we would take our Hamiltonian right and we would plug in our expressions for the fields and we take this derivative and then we'd have a whole bunch of fun with playing around with the commutation relations of our A's and B's and A daggers and B daggers right and when the smoke clears you find the Hamiltonian takes this form so you have the sum over I mean an integral over P and then you have a sum over spins and you get a term that looks like uh, energy times AP dagger AP. And then you get a term that looks like EP, BP dagger EP. But there's a, mi a relative minus sign between the two. Okay. And this minus sign spells doom for our theory. Uh -oh. 
right? Because what it's telling us is that if I use the B operator, the B dagger operator to create more and more of those particles, that my energy is going to keep getting lower and lower, right? With no bounds. Okay? And that's a that's a bad net. Okay, so our, eventually our energy <coughs> would go negative position. Okay. And uh, so we're somehow screwed, okay? And what we need to do is try to figure out either how to fix it or figure out where we went wrong um, and change that, okay? And you could say, well, wait a minute. If I go back to this idea that, you know, um, when I write down uh, these field expressions, remember, we start out in classical, right? Uh, classical physics, and these guys are just coefficients. Right? So you think, well, maybe I can just change what I call B into B dagger, right? And what I call B dagger, call that B, okay? Because what that would do then is, uh, is hopefully, you know, correct the sign, right? But if you do that, it screws up the commutation relation, right? So you would pick up a minus sign the commutation relation, and so that doesn't work. Okay? So we need we need these guys to satisfy this equation, not minus this this commutator. Okay? So you can't. So you know, some smart person might think, oh, maybe I can just what I call b, what we call b dagger, and, and it turns out that that doesn't work. Okay. All right. So then you say, okay, well. If I change B with B dagger, it screws up the commutation relation, right? So maybe uh, the fact that we're using commutators for our operators, or you know, or imposing commutation relations on our operators, maybe there's something fundamentally wrong with that, right? So maybe we should try, uh, I don't know, using anti-commutators, okay? So in other words, uh, choosing to not impose commutation relations, but anti-commutation relations between our fields by a x dagger b y. So these are my best curly braces. Okay. Um, and these would be delta three x minus y uh, delta function in the spinner indices. Okay. And that would mean that, and, and, and all other anti-commutators are zero. And that would mean that our annihilation and creation operators uh, should also obey uh, anti-commutation relations. So these are the non-zero ones. Yes. Equals what? Two pi cubed. Okay, so let's do this instead. Let's try. I mean, it's worth trying, right? Because right now we're stuck. Okay, so what you do is you go back to the beginning. All right, I'm going to save all that work. All right. And I'm going to tell you that when I compute this thing, so I, I use these relationships. The Hamilton, there's nothing wrong with the Hamiltonian. We know that. So let's plug you know, the, our, our field expressions in and impose these anti-commutation relations and see what we get. Okay. And in this case, we get um, integral over p. We get the sum over s. We get EP, HPS dagger, AP, plus EP, EPS dagger. Oops, no, we don't. We get the minus sign. Okay, and at that point, you're like, all right, <laughs> WTF, okay? All right? So we tried commutation relations. Uh, we got you know this problem of, of negative energy, like a negative energy cascade. 
Now we try anti-commutation relation, and it looks like we still have the same problem. But this time, but this time yes, this time, because they're anti-commutators, this time we can change. We're free to change what we call B and B dagger. Okay? Because that's now, since these guys obey commutation relations, when I flip B and B dagger, I'm not going to pick up a minus sign in the commutation relation. All right, so I go back to, uh, I'll, I'll rewrite it, but I go back to here, right? And instead of what I have, instead of B here, I'll put B dagger. Okay? And then likewise, in the, in the side dagger equation, I'll have B, not B dagger. Okay? And so what that allows you to do is, find that the Hamiltonian looks like uh, d 3 p 2 pi q, right? You would compute this thing, and you get an overall factor of EP up front. You get APS dagger, and AP, and then you get, uh, you get minus uh, B, P, S, uh, and B, P, S dagger. Right, but I use my anti-commutation relation on this guy, right, and it's going to give me uh, so it's going to give me d3p by q over ap aps dagger ap, and it'll give me a plus um, what dps dagger p. And then it's going to give me something. Let me just forget the constants for a minute. It's going to give me this delta function, right, with uh, zero argument. Okay? And this is the same vacuum energy that we ran into in the Klein Gordon case. Okay? All right? So there's no getting around it. Uh, it pops up in the same, you know, the same place that it did in the Klein Gordon equation. But since we're all theorists in here, uh, we're just going to say, okay, well, you know, we can't measure uh, absolute energies. All we can do is measure, you know, relative energies, right? So it doesn't matter that I have an infinite term there. I can just kind of sweep it under the rug, all right? And we'll get to that when we talk about our normalization. But, uh, or at least, you know, I, uh, a more concrete way of doing it besides sweeping it under the rug. So we have our Hamiltonian for, for, uh, for spin one half particles, okay, in terms of annihilation and creation operators. Okay. And so let me just write rewrite the field real quick. So again, like I said, the field looked like p um, by q p. And some of this, and then I have my A, uh, S, and A, P, S. My U is P. And here I have E to the minus I of P dot X. Right. But then here I have my V, so the, and the coefficient of V now is going to be, our V is going to be V dagger. Okay, so that's what our field's going to look like, and I'll leave it to your imagination what the side dagger looks like. Okay? Just take side dagger, and this will become a field, and then it'll become an A dagger. Okay, so we've got we've got uh, our Hamiltonian. We know you know that you know. So now we know the energy eigenvalues, right? We've got our eigen, we've got our eigenfunctions. Um, and the next thing to do would be to, because we're following this analogy of simple harmonic oscillator, is to start to build up our state, right? That's always the next step. And so what we want to do first is define uh, what we call the vacuum, right? And to define the vacuum, I'll have some state that has a zero here, and this state is going to be annihilated not only by A, but also B. Okay, so these guys are my annihilation operators. Okay. Then I can create one particle states, 
or the multi-particle space by operating with the A daggers and B daggers. Okay, so my one particle state looks like this. So I'm going to write, it's going to be a have momentum eigenvalue P, but it's a spinner, so it's got a spin eigenvalue. So I'm going to put that as S. And these guys I'm going to create by operating with, say, AP dagger on the vacuum. Okay? But we want these things to, um, you know, when we uh, compute uh, inner products between bras and cats, we want these guys to be Lorentz invariant. So what we can do is put in a, a factor here that is going to ensure that we get uh, Lorentz invariant scalars when we compute uh, inner products. Okay? So this is a one particle state for uh, the particles created by a dagger, okay? And by definition, these guys we're gonna call fermions. So the particles that are created by a dagger are what we call fermions. Okay? And I'll also have another one particle state okay, that'll be created by the B dagger. And these guys are going to be called anti fermions. All right, it's just by convention. Okay, there's nothing uh, at this point. There was nothing uh, to distinguish a dagger and b dagger. Right? They were just coefficients of. Well, I guess there there is right. One's the coefficient of the u spinner, and the other one's the coefficient of the b spinner. And those are uh, positive and negative frequencies. Uh, 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 solution. Okay, so that's what that's what uh, distinguishes them, and, and that's why we call the ones associated with the V uh, anti fermions. All right. And so what you can do is you can uh, you can show that if I take the inner product of say uh, two one particle states, uh, you get something that goes like two p. Okay, and this thing, uh, I don't know if we showed it this semester, but we should, I'm pretty sure we showed it during the summer that this thing is Lorentz invariant. Okay, so that's it. So we've, we've uh, Constructed our Hamiltonian. Right? We wrote down our states in terms of our solutions uh, of the Dirac equation, uh, and we wrote them as linear superpositions. Right? They're plane waves. Uh, we knew that because the, the field uh, satisfied the Klein-Gordon equation, and uh, uh, we found initially that if we impose commutate, commutation relations on the A's and B's, that we ran into this negative energy. Uh, right. And the way around that was to change the commutation relations into anti commutation relations. Okay? And the fact that they're anti commutators, there's a, there's a thing called the spin statistics theorem that uh, you know, we probably won't get into it here, but it state, you know, basically states that if particles obey commutators, then they are bosons. Particles obey anti-commutators, they are fermions, okay? All right, so there's a linkage between uh, the spin and uh, the statistics that those particles obey. Okay? Uh, if you look in the Shrednicki book, he has a nice discussion on the spin statistics there. Okay, all right, so one last thing to do, right? and that is we want to be able to, to compute the Dirac propagator. Okay. In other words, we want to compute uh, propagation amplitudes. Right? So these guys, are zero, so psi a and x, and psi bar y. Okay. And let me plug in our field expressions. 
do some simplification, so this is going to be a one-liner, but there's some work that goes into this. Um, and I have my stem sum over U, A, S, and then P, U bar, S, and then B, P, and then I've got an E to the minus I, P dot X minus Y. Okay? So, like I said, there's some work that goes into that that we're obviously skipping. Okay? But now I can use um, my spin sum relation, right? Remember we derived the spin sums, right? So here's the one I want, the P slash plus M. Okay, so let me write that as uh, D through P by cubed over the two P. Right? And then I have P slash plus M E to the minus I of P dot X minus one. Okay. And now what I can do is use a, a bit of trickery. Okay, I can rewrite this p slash because I notice that I have a p up here, right? And this is exponential, so I can really rewrite this p slash as a derivative, either on x or y. All right. So what I can do? Let me pick x. Okay. So I can write this thing as I'm going to pull it out the front. So it's an operator that, uh, so this is my derivative d slash, and I'm gonna put x here just so we know that it's operating on x and not y. Okay. And then I have my plus m, and these things have spinner indices a and b, I'm coming from this p slash here. And then I've got this integral, d3p, d pi cubed, d to the minus i p dot x minus one. Okay. So that's that's one part of the of the propagation amplitude. Remember, remember we have to consider uh, the case where uh, time x happened before time y, and then vice versa. And we did the Klein Gordon propagation. Okay. And if you do the if you do it uh, the other part, so this would be remember these are time ordered products. So this is psi b now. Or side A of X. Right, if you do this guy, you get basically the same thing, but you get a minus out in front. And I have to remember that um, if I switch X and Y, that this this is e to the minus i, no, it's e to the minus i p dot y minus x. Right, because I need to sum over these two. Right, so that's why I've got one here and one here. Right, so then I'm taking both uh, possibilities as far as time order. So let me put it together, put these two pieces together, okay? Because I want, uh, I need to compute the commutator of these, or anti-commutator. So I bar, D, and then that, okay? And I get overall factor of I del slash X plus M, D. Then I have uh, my integral d3p by cubed 1 over 2dp. And then I have e to the minus i p dot x minus y minus e to the minus i p dot y minus x. Closing bracket here. Okay? And this thing, luckily for us, we've already done it once. Okay, this is this part inside here. This is the same integral. Um, if you look back as the Klein Gordon case. All right, so you remember what a nightmare that was because we had to uh, uh, 
use uh, the contour integration, the residue theorem, and, and, and you know uh, all that stuff. But we actually computed it in order as related to uh, uh, Green's function or retarded Green's function and all that stuff. But you can do the same thing. You get the same results, right? The only difference is I've got this derivative acting out in front. Okay? And in the end, we were able to compute uh, for the Klein Gordon case what we called the the propagator, I think we call it DF, and it's something like D4P, 2 pi to the fourth. So this is after all the contour integration. Right? And so that was the propagator uh, that we got uh, for the Klein Gordon case. For the Dirac case, if you go through the same steps that, that we did there, Dirac, you get the Feynman propagator, and let's call it fit something different, so let's call it S. Okay? And this is going to be D4P. It's all going to be the same. D of minus y P dot X minus Y, except uh, because of this operator out front. So it's going to give me a factor of P slash plus M. Okay. So this, you know, like when we were doing the Klein Gordon case, and I pointed out that this result was, you know, the most important result of that lecture, right? Uh, because we'll, we'll come back to it when we start to construct our Feynman rules. This piece right here is the most important result of what we've done today. Okay? Because, like I said, it's going to be, uh, it's going to help us to you know, construct our Feynman rules. Okay? So this thing's going to represent internal propagators of Feynman diagrams for fermions. Okay? And then just, just remember that this thing is, is uh, the same thing as the time order product. Okay, so that's it. This is the this is the thing that you want to take away. All right. So the most important things that we did today: this and these spin sums. Okay. So you want to commit these to memory, memory, and uh, we'll work more with the direct propagator later. Okay. So I'm gonna I'm, so I'm gonna stop there, and uh, I have no idea what time it is, but. Um, Oh, okay. Um, and next time we'll pick it up, we'll start to talk about symmetries of the Dirac theory. Okay. Uh, in particular, we'll talk about some discrete symmetries like charge and uh, kind of Okay. All right. Any questions? Okay. Uh, you guys in Brownsville, I'll, I'll just email you uh, your grades for the homework. I graded it. Okay. Thank you. Okay. See you guys Wednesday. Bye. Bye. See ya.